Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That's enough of that crap. <laughs> How are you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, none of your business, huh? Oh, well. <laughs> this off. One of the uh, one of the greatest killers in our society is not wars or disease or disasters, it's stress. Stress is a great killer, and yet we need stress. We need stress to give us the energy to allow us to do the things that we want to achieve. Yet in our society, what we actually do, we create stress, we have the energy, but we don't know how to, how to get rid of it. For example, in, uh, in prehistoric times, an ancient man, uh, well, not so much an ancient man, because the lifespan of prehistoric man was only about 22 years of age, so he couldn't be a 22-year-old ancient man. <laughs> but if this, if this ancient man was walking down a path and went around a corner and there was a saber-toothed tiger there, he would immediately go into stress. Now what actually happens to the body is that the brain, the hormones and the sympathetic nervous system come into operation to give you great energy, great strength and energy to, uh, to deal with the situation that has been caused by the stress. And in this situation, the, the, the prehistoric man, through the energy, would have enough strength to pick up a boulder, which in normal circumstances he couldn't even budge, pick up the boulder and brain this big, long-toothed pussycat. <laughs> Either that or have enough strength to outrun the beast or even leap up ten feet into a tree where the other saber-toothed tiger is waiting. <laughs> but by doing all this, you see, they get rid of their energy. In our society... What's actually happened? We don't know how to get rid of the energy. You're sitting in your office and your boss comes in. And he's very demeanor, he's very style, whatever it might be. He will, he will put you in stress, slight stress. He'll, he'll just look at you and go, ah, uh, you. And immediately you become stressful inside. You're thinking, why me? <laughs> what does he want? What have I done? And if he calls you by your surname, you're really in stress. <laughs> And what is actually happening now, your heart starts to beat, your pressure goes up, your blood pressure goes up, there's blood zooming through your heart, more oxygen through to the brain, your whole body is filling up with adrenaline. Pure energy whipping around. Your legs are beginning to get tight. Muscles tighten up, you're beginning to sweat. This adrenaline is just pumping, pumping and pumping, around and around and around. And what you should do is run away or pick up a chair and bring the basket. <laughs> but we don't. All that energy just keeps on churning and churning around and around and around. Turns to sugar and fat, which causes extraordinary damage to the system. And we don't even continue in that stress. You sit there, you, you take all these recriminations from the boss, whatever it might be, and then you start to recriminate against yourself. You, you start to accuse yourself of being a weakling. What, what the hell did I take that? <laughs> Who the hell does he think he is? For Christ's sake. I'm not here to listen to that crap. Why don't I talk? Stick your job up your ass. <laughs> He's down the corridor by now, but you're going through it. <laughs> and not only that, not only that, you still have distress, but you pass the stress on to other people, sympathetic people. Your secretary will say, can I help you? Piss off, you. What the hell are you? <laughs> you bloody bimbo, go back to your tiger. You get in your car, you're driving home, some totally innocent pedestrian on a pedestrian crossing, walking <laughs> You get home, your child says, hello, daddy. Who are you talking to? <laughs> Don't give me that, hello, daddy. Stress comes to us from very early. I was, I was a, I was a thumb sucker. <laughs> What is it with the world that comes down very heavily on thumb suckers? I mean, it's just a very natural thing for a child to do, suck the thumb. But I've seen parents all over the world yanking thumbs out of children. Take that out of your mouth! Is that supposed to have it? You're three years of age!
kids grow up, for Christ's sake, Larry! <laughs> Why? I mean, surely the main purpose of being a parent is to love your children and allow them to be happy. And if it's thumb sucking, gives them happiness, let them be happy. My parents would go to an extraordinary lengths to stop me from sucking my thumb. My mother used to knit little woolly hats. <laughs> And then she put knots of cat gut in there. <laughs> but my gums would bleed. <laughs> but I used to go through them anyhow. <laughs> mustard. They tried mustard, for Christ's sake. Oh my thought, mustard. Chili sauce. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> now this is a time, this is a time when, when Hitler, Adolf Hitler, was rampaging around Europe. He's invaded Poland, Norway, Holland. Belgium, France. My parents are not concerned with that. All they're concerned about is my thumb sucking. <laughs> I lay in bed one night and I heard them talking downstairs. They've gone out and bought this special product which will dissuade me from sucking my thumb. And I'm upstairs in the room. <laughs> and I can hear them down there saying, Do you get it? Yes. What do you do with it? Well, you take his thumb out of his mouth and you paint it on his thumb. It's got a lot of bitters and he'll associate the bitter taste with thumb sucking and eventually he'll give it up. So I'm lying now. <laughs> and I hear them coming up the steps on home. <laughs> and a split second before they come in, I switch thumbs. <laughs> They go through the whole procedure. They take this thumb out. Now, I'm acting. I know what they're doing. Hang on. Mm, mm, mm. And they're... Mm, mm. And, they start, and they start painting it. And then they shove it back in my mouth. And now I become... I get an Oscar for this. I'm going... And I get him saying, it's working. I'm going to go out of the room and I go... <laughs> Talk about stress. I mean, how stressful it is for a child to sit in a pushchair. You ever, ever watched them in pushchairs? They're zonked with stress. They're on that level of exhaust pipes. <laughs> pumping lead and carbon monoxide into them. You ever, have you ever watched? Have you ever watched a mother with a pushchair across the road? Have you? What goes into the road first? <laughs> have you ever, at any time, seen a mother come to a crossing and back out into the road? <laughs> they don't do that. The child is a test pilot for the safety of the road. What's going on? The kid is there. My name, my name, no. It means there's a truck coming. But... My mother, when I was a child, my mother used to, uh, she used to discipline me through my absent father. I don't mean he was absent, he was just at work. <laughs> she would say, don't do that. Don't do that. If daddy, if daddy saw you do that, daddy would be very, 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 very angry. Daddy does not like that. <laughs> do not talk to mommy like that. Daddy would not like it. It doesn't matter what way Daddy talks to Mommy, you don't talk to Mommy like that. <laughs> Daddy would be very angry with you and he'd beat your bottom. No, you cannot have another sweet. Daddy says too many sweets are bad for you. I personally would let you have another one, but Daddy says no. <laughs> Daddy says they're bad for the teeth and worms will grow in your tummy and come out and eat the sweet shop. <laughs> no, Daddy will not play piggybacks with you when he comes home. Daddy will be very tired. And you know what Daddy's like when he's tired? He gets very angry. And if he's very angry, he'll probably stop your pocket money and lock you in the cellar. <laughs> oh, my father, you knew nothing about this. He loved me. I think he loved me. He'd come home and go, hello, David, give us a kiss. Ah, I was gone. <laughs> I was behind my mother. <laughs> my father said, what's the matter with him? No idea. <laughs> he's obviously frightened of you. He didn't know it, but he was a monster. <laughs> it's extraordinary how we put things on people. I mean, what about, what about the mythology we teach the children? The mythology of 
the wicked witches. I mean, what about that for stress? Oh, the bogeyman. I mean, we actually say this to people we love. A bogeyman. <laughs> the Sandman. Who is this lunatic? The Sandman. My, my parents used to say, the Sandman is coming. Who? <laughs> the Sandman. It's time to go to bed because the Sandman is going to come along and sprinkle sand in your eyes and you'll go to sleep. Would you sleep? <laughs> in the world would sleep in a house knowing there's a bloody lunatic walking around with a bag of sand. <laughs> he's going to let you have two handfuls in the eyes when he gets you. The great long red-legged scissor man. What about him who cuts off your thumbs and puts them in a bag? We had the humpty back leprechaun, for Christ's sake. <laughs> who will put you in a sack and take you to live beneath the hawthorn tree. Jesus, I used to lie in bed. Like a little... <laughs> I wet the bed. <laughs> My mother would come in and say, What? Look, at you wet the bed. I'm going to tie a knot in that. That's what I'm going to do. Why did you wet the bed? Why didn't you get up and go to the lavatory? I'm going to... You are so silly. You are so silly. You are so stupid. There is no such thing as a Sandman. Or a long red legged scissor, or a humpty back leprechaun. There's no... But you said there were. I know I said there were, but I was only telling you things. So you have something to think about when you went to sleep. <laughs> and even if they did it against, do you actually think that mummy, mummy would allow any of these things to get near her little boy? Now I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to clean the bed up and put on nice pyjamas. And please, now go to sleep. Otherwise I'll have to phone the police and they'll take you away and put you in a cell. <laughs> School was quite terrifying, too, the first time you go to school. There's another. My father said to me, there'll be a boy in a school who'll want to hit you. First day in school, somebody will want to hit you. Now, that is a school bully. Now, all school bullies are cowards. And he'll only hit you if he thinks that you're frightened of him. So if you hit him first, he will run away. <laughs> I was expelled in two weeks for being a school bully. I mean, you kid, I came out, I used to beat the shit out of them. <laughs> the, issue, the interesting thing about taking ch anything to do with children's school, uh, when my son was about four, four and a half, I think four, something around four, um, I explained to him that he was going to have to start school. He wanted to know about school, and I said, well, the reason you go to school is to learn. You learn how to read English, and you learn about the world, and mathematics, and general, general knowledge, in, in a sense. It's a little kind of kindergarten. I like all kids. They ask very sensible questions. And he said, how long, how, long, how, long, how long will I be at school for? And I said, well, all depending, about seven, till you're about 17 years, I suppose. So that was mine. Put him in the car, took him there, arrived in the school, into the little changing room. And it was, it was, it was like kind of shedding years myself. I went into this little, and there's a, the coat rack that's down on this level. <laughs> and all little boot boxes, and all the lavatories, very low. <laughs> There's a the smell of chalk and socks and knickers and all that. <laughs> and I took his coat off and I said, are you okay? And he said, yes, I'm all right. Then. I said, now you'll be okay. You'll enjoy it. It'll be very good. Okay? Now I've got to go. All right? Bye, then. Bye, Nanny. So just as so I'm going out the door, I turn around and he said, Nanny. And I turn around and he's just beginning to crack. The chin is just beginning. <laughs> I said, yes. He said, you won't forget to come back for me when I'm 17. <laughs> do, you know, do, you know, do you actually know the most stressful place for the average person? is the home. You'd actually think, in reality, that the home is the one place where you're safe from the tribulations of life. But it's, it's, it's the opposite. All even kind of petty incidents take on their own life in their own home. Now, I, I, had, I had two brothers who snored. Now, 
if people don't know about snoring, that's okay. But anybody who knows and lives with a snorer knows exactly how stressful it is. <laughs> it is extra extraordinary. Extraordinary thing about snorers, snorers never have any trouble going to sleep. <laughs> there is no such thing as an insomniac snorer. <laughs> they get into bed, good night, <laughs> gone. <laughs> now, my, me, it takes... It takes me probably 30 or 40 minutes to go to sleep. Always has. So, well, as far as my two brothers were concerned, we used to share the same room. I would go to bed an hour or an hour and a half earlier than the other two to try and get to sleep before they came up the room. And I'd be up there a half an hour and I'd still be awake and everything. Because I've only got an hour. <laughs> oh, shit, it's 42 minutes. Oh, 18. Oh, my goodness. Christ, seven. Ah, oh, shit, they're on the stairs. How am I gone? And they'd arrive in. And I... Don't! <laughs> now, the two of them they didn't snore the same. This is the only thing. They didn't snore. Brother Peter had a, had a snore like... Because old people are individual and snore. He had a... <laughs> and I... To listen to that. Jesus. All night... I'd shove him at the time, he'd go, and he'd go. <laughs> and I mean, you started to play games with it. I used to cut out bits of paper and lick them and stick them to his lips. <laughs> and he'd go, and they'd all go, oh. <laughs> and then he'd go, <laughs> I used to get bath bubbles and rub it all around his mouth, hoping that a great balloon would come out one day and he'd disappear out the window. <laughs> It would have been lovely. John, John my, my other brother, had what I would call a long, single snore. He would start... Stop. <laughs> and you'd expect a gush of air to come out. <laughs> Nothing. Not, not a sound. Within two seconds, he'd start again. <laughs> I think he had a leak in his arse. I don't know what it was. <laughs> Taking it in, the man's going out. <laughs> it's, not only, not, it's not only people that cause stress, but there are. There are places that cause stress. Things that cause stress. The bathroom, I suppose, um, is the most, perhaps one of the most stressful places. Uh, toothpaste tubes. Have you ever come across toothpaste tubes? People don't put the top on, and it congeals, and it just sits there, and you're the one that gets it, and you're going, oh, Christ. <laughs> and suddenly the boom, <laughs> and the mirror, there's got to be a large on it. The soap. You've seen a soap in a pool of water. How about that for stressfulness in the house? <laughs> Looks like a decomposing scallop. <laughs> or the stinking flannel, which goes very beautifully with the damp, soggy towel which is thrown in the corner. <laughs> Have you ever sat on the loo reading the paper? And the blind suddenly goes... <laughs> My, my, one of the things I love to do, I love to bath. I mean, I actually do love to bathe. I love to languish, is the word. I really do. I just love to sit in a bath. I listen to music. And I kind of peruse, I think. I think about material. I think about gags. I think about life in general. And it's wonderful. And I, I never get out of a bath. I don't actually want to leap out of a bath when I'm finished. I like to kind of let it hang on. What I do, I, I get the, the plug with my toes and I pull it out with my toes. And then as the water recedes, I, I slightly like to go down with it. <laughs> Just to see how long I can stay there without... The worst thing in the world is to pull up and nothing happens. It's like a kind of stagnant pool with me in it. The water doesn't go anywhere. And I have to go to the plug hole. And you, you, you go... 
<laughs> oh, ye Christ. A wadge of hair. Have you come across that? <laughs> <laughs> and it's never yours. It's always <laughs> under the office. And it comes across, it comes out like the monster from the deep, you know. <laughs> and you always try to flick it into the lavatory. You always. <laughs> and you miss, it hits the wall. <laughs> what, what is it? I mean, why can't the young, in a sense, why can't the young people in the world, why can't they clean the bath when they finish it? They can't even pick up a hint. I said to my son a couple of years ago, I said, you know, we have one of the oldest baths in the world. He said, really? How do you know that? I said, I count the rings. <laughs> and I cleaned the bath. I cleaned the bath. I mean, I didn't when I was young, but I do now. And I've tried to teach my own children that when you've had a bath, clean it out for the next person. Because you know what it's like when you go into a bathroom and there's that big grimy thing. I get out of the bath, I clean the bath. I go back for another bath. The grime is there. <laughs> and I go through this kind of question. I'll say to my daughter, I said, do you have a bath? No, Daddy, I didn't. No. You didn't? No, I didn't. And I'll hear myself saying stupid things like, are you sure? <laughs> and she said, yes, Daddy, I'm sure. I'm 22 years of age. I do know when I take my clothes off. I do know when the bath is full of water. I do know I am capable of recognizing these things. I haven't had a bath. I go to my son. Have you had a bath? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Three of us in the house, nobody's had a bath. <laughs> Mr. Bloody Nobody lives in our house. Has a bath, makes hundreds of phone calls, empties the fridge and pisses off. <laughs> and the great, the great disappearing lavatory paper act. Have you ever <laughs> come across that? Nobody uses lavatory paper. But it always goes. I've had my children for years. I brought them up and I'm saying to them, listen, let me explain. Let me explain just very simple physics. The physics of this. And when you take something away from something which is large, it diminishes. It gets smaller. Do you understand? And I have them all in the lavatory with me. And I'm saying, look, <laughs> this is a lavatory roll. Look. And when I start to take bits of paper off, the big piece here begins to get smaller. And they're all saying, nuh, nuh, nuh. <laughs> Heads off again. <laughs> and I said, explain it. When you get to the end of it, you'll know there is no paper there because there is a little cardboard roll. That means all the paper has gone. <laughs> so when you see the roll, you get off your bum, go to the cupboard, and bring back another roll. <laughs> Because I never, no adult, when you go to the lab, you don't check to see that the paper is there, do you? <laughs> and you never notice it's all gone until you've finished. <laughs> or they've left one sheet. <laughs> the older, the older you get in life. The more, I suppose, in a sense, intelligent you should be, because you've gone through the experiences, the more capable you should be, certainly, with dealing with stress. But it's, there are times when you actually think that you've got stress beaten, and then somebody, somebody invents or brings in another development. My, my pet hate at the moment, my real pet at the moment, junk mail. I suffer from junk mail. Now, who needs it? Who, who wants it? Who, who, in the name of Christ, reads it? <laughs> I did, to start off with. I was, I was taken in by it. I would pick it all up and I'd go, oh, look at that. Hey, look, I've got a prize. I've got a prize. I've got a prize. <laughs> Bloody dickhead, I've got a prize. <laughs> look at this. Hey, wow, we. Somebody wants to sell me a book that's worth 10 pounds for 50p. <laughs> Shit! <laughs> There's somebody in the south of France with a villa who wants me to share the holidays with them. And I think, why are they doing this? I don't know why they're doing it. They want my money. That's why they're doing it. It's a con. And not only is it a con, 
But what they actually do is they play on your emotions. They draw your emotions into it. They draw in kind of things like, they show you the wrong side of yourself. They show you greed and avarice, um, one-upmanship, all those various things. Then, then they'll play on your, your kindness and your generosity. And they'll kind of, your concern for your family or your fear for your family. I mean, isn't it, isn't it kind of extraordinary to wake up in the morning and the first piece of junk mail you come across is so enlightening because it comes from a life assurance company, <laughs> which says, I mean, I read it, it says, Dear Mr. Allen, do you know that you could die today? <laughs> <laughs> by natural causes or by accident. Now, isn't it time that you began to think about your family? I'm thinking, you asshole. <laughs> Why do I want to think about them? I'm dying, for Christ's sake, it's me. Do you know that psychologists tell us that the very act of putting three things, things through a door have sexual connotations? And that to some people, it's precisely like having sexual intercourse. <laughs> well, I, I have no idea whether that's true or not. But if it is true, it means that I'm being screwed by 20 strangers a day. <laughs> Have you ever been upstairs and listened to the junk mail come through the door? <laughs> Sounds like a cow shitting through your little box. <laughs> now let me tell you, any, any, anybody that runs a junk mail company who happens to be watching this show tonight, <laughs> let me make one thing quite clear, really. I do not want to buy a house. I do not want to sell a house. I do not want to share a house. I do not want my legs waxed, or my face waxed, or my pipes plumbed. I don't want a new conservatory, a new roof, or a new nose. I don't want to buy a book, play bingo, or have all the fat sucked out of my body. What I want is peace and quiet, so would you please it's a favor to me. Take your brochures, take your papers, take your pamphlets, and your vouchers, and very gently, very deliberately, <laughs> but quite dignifiedly, stick them up your ass. I should have said with great dignity, quite dignifiedly. <laughs> quite dignifiedly. <laughs> the, world, the world is here to test us. I mean, I love, I love in Congress things like parks. I go to the park. There's all the rules and regulations. People don't want you in the parks. No ball games. No skating, no kites, no cycling, no music. This is a recreational area. Piss off. <laughs> walk on the path. The path's very important. Walk on the path. Do not walk on the grass. Do not stand on the grass. Do not lie on the grass. Do not hop or roll on the grass. Get off the grass! <laughs> Don't touch the flowers. Don't pick the flowers, don't smell the flowers. How could you? They're surrounded by grass. You're not allowed on the grass. <laughs> don't climb the trees. Don't swing from the trees. Do not interfere with the trees. <laughs> what sort of a kinky bastard do they take me for? <laughs> Sitting around groping oaks all day. <laughs> I live near a place which had a small pond, invariably had ducks on this pond. And I used to go through this every morning, this was years ago. And there was a big sign in the pond which says, do not feed the ducks. Feeding of the ducks is forbidden. Feeding of the ducks can lead to prosecution and a possible fine by order of whatever authority it was. And I used to go through that, and there always seemed to be one little duck sitting in the water. And I would go by, and he'd look at me and go, <laughs> I used to talk 
to him. I got on talking terms. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not allowed to. Look, big sign. I know you can't read, but it says, I'm not allowed to feed you. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> and one day in the winter, I go through. There's a sheet of ice. And there he is. And it looks like he's huddling. <laughs> and as I walk by, I go, And I broke. I went off and got a sandwich. And I came back, and I'm surreptitiously feeding him. I'm feeding the duck like I'm a spy, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and he's in it. <laughs> and suddenly, from nowhere, I have a lunatic in a uniform beside me. What are you doing, sir? My friend, the duck, gone. He's gone. <laughs> Pure loyalty. Whack. Gone. What do, you, what, do you, what do you think you're doing, sir? What? What, what do you think you're doing, sir? Uh, what? I'm just not doing anything. I'm just... All right, sir, let's, let's put it another way. Can you read? Yes, I can. <laughs> can you read that sign? <laughs> what does it say? Will you read it? Yes, I can. Well, read it! Do not feed the ducks. It's forbidden to feed the ducks. <laughs> Feeding the ducks can lead to a possible fire. And <laughs> what does it mean? What do you mean? What does it mean? What does the sign mean? It means I'm not allowed to feed the ducks. <laughs> means what? I'm not allowed. To feed. And what did you do? I fed the ducks. <laughs> I fed the ducks. And that means you can be possible. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> don't, 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 See them out there with their dogs sniffing and farting and crying. <laughs> yeah, do you ever watch dogs in park? Do, do you ever really watch dogs in park? When they meet another dog, what do they do? What does a dog do when it meets another dog? <laughs> they never face each other. So, is this Uranus? <laughs> yes. Do you, do you mind me sniffing Uranus? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you want to be sniffing your anus while you're sniffing my tenor <laughs> That is good. What do we do now? Well, there's some turd over there. Let's eat that. <laughs> and then the master goes, Hey, boy! Hey, boy! Come on, boy! Come on! Hey, boy! Hey, boy! Hey, ho, 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 ho. Come on, come on. Good boy. Give daddy a kiss. Hello. <laughs> Have you ever watched those, those owners with the dogs playing with them with the stick game and the rock game? Go, fetch! Go, boy, fetch! Picks it up and he brings it back. Good boy, good boy. Have a go. Good boy, what good boy, good boy, clever boy, clever, clever. What is clever about that? What is clever about running over there, picking up a stick and bringing it back here when it was here in the first place? <laughs> you have to be a real pea brain to be happy with that. <laughs> and that goes on all day. Hey, boy. <laughs> but eventually there's a point where the dog gets tired of it. And he wants to kind of wander off. And that's always the point when the master wants to go home. Hey, boy. And the voice change. Hey, boy. Now it's not. Hey, boy. Now it's. Hey, boy. But stripes on him now. Hey, boy. <laughs> hey, boy. Now the dog wants to go. Hey, boy. Rose. Rose. Rose, come out. <laughs>
out one of those sonic whistles. Have you seen those things? And they go, and every dog in the park goes. The master is now picking up rocks out of the ground and throwing them at his best friend. It's not for his best friend to pick up and bring back. to take his bloody brains out. <laughs> now the dog thinks this is a new game. Now fetch the brick instead of the stick. And off he goes. <laughs> and every time he picks it up, another one goes over his head, so he drops that one. And, he, and I've actually saw a fellow in Richmond Park as close to a cardiac arrest as anybody. <laughs> You heard him say, if you do not come now, you will walk home. Thank you. You've been a lovely audience. Good night. May your God go with you.